Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together in the name of your Son. We ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds to his presence. Draw us near to him. Help us to receive from him, Lord, your words, your love, your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. We commend ourselves into your hands. And we say, speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If I, listening to the hymn that we just sang, Hail Thou Once Despised of Jesus, that actually has the whole gospel in it. You, you could read that hymn and go, okay, I've heard a good sermon for today. And, and then go home. <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily have to e even listen to me. Because what the, what the hymn offers in very, very clear, declarative language, this is what God has done. Therefore, we praise him. Hail once despised in Jesus. Is the essence of what makes us Christian. What we, in fact, believe. The story goes like this, and it, it starts right in the Jeremiah prophecy at the very beginning of the Old Testament lesson, where in the midst of a nation that has absolutely been besieged by its enemies, everything that could have gone wrong could had has gone wrong, including Jeremiah, prophet, somebody they've literally arrested because they don't want to hear the word from God, from him, and thrown him into a pit, like we don't want to hear from you anymore. Out of that incredibly dire situation, God speaks a word of hope through the prophet Jeremiah, saying, here's what's coming. It's not here yet. But the day is coming where I will take this very, very stubborn people, and I'm going to change the very nature of their heart. No longer will they have this hardened heart of stone, but instead I'm going to give them a tender heart. And I'm not just going to give them a tender heart, I'm going to literally write my law in their hearts so that they just naturally do the very thing that I ask of them. You see, what had gotten Israel in trouble to begin with was the fact that God had laid out a very clear law. They had said, well... That's, a, that's not for me. And in the face of their rejection of the law of God, judgment had come. Marauding armies, occupational forces, literally taken over the land. The land desolated and destroyed. Jeremiah continues to say, if you'll repent and come back, all of this is going to stop. They would not listen. Eventually arrested Jeremiah. And, and God, in essence, knows something has to change. In other words, that rebellious capacity that is within the human heart has to change if things are going to be right. And it is out of that dilemma that God says, I'm going to change their hearts. I'll do it. They can't do this for themselves. I will do it. I will give them notice. They don't earn it. I will give them a new heart. And I will, in that new heart, write down the very things that are good and true so that they will intuitively know inside what is, in fact, the right thing to do. They will, as a result, and here's the capstone, they will know the Lord. They will experience Him. Knowledge meaning not just a cerebral comprehension, but there will be, God's Spirit will literally be in them. They will be in an intimate relationship with God. Now, it hadn't happened. What Jeremiah prophesied says, this is what I'm going to do, and it hadn't happened yet. But something needed to happen for that to be accomplished, for there to be the capacity for us to receive from God the very thing that was promised all the way back in the prophet Jeremiah. And that's what we see both in the epistle lesson in Hebrews, in the gospel reading, is Jesus choosing to do for us <coughs> as the Son of God, what we could not accomplish for ourselves, which was to be given complete, total, full forgiveness. 
so that in the cleansing word of forgiveness, won for us by Jesus' death and resurrection, we would have as a result the capacity to be able to receive the very thing that was promised to us in the prophet Jeremiah. An intimate relationship with God where we would know him, where even in the midst of our sin and failure, because of something new that's been birthed in us, there is with, birthed within us both forgiveness and the capacity for change. God begins to work in us things that we could never ever work in ourselves. And what's the invitation? How does that come about? It goes all the way back to the opening verse that I read before we offered the confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In other words, so long as you're in the position of saying, I don't need what he had to offer. I, I'm doing just fine, thank you very much. Then what the scripture says about us is that point, we have no idea what the true condition of our life is at all. We deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. In other words, we do not have an accurate picture of the true nature of what's really going on in our life at all. But if on the other hand, we acknowledge what God has already said is the problem. I've got a hardened heart. I need Jesus to come in and break up that heart, create within me a new kind of tenderness toward him, and work in me the capacity to become someone that I could never be without him. Ah, that's why the confession of sin is necessary. I need to come and lay all of who I am before God himself knowing that what I most need, what I most need is his forgiveness and his capacity to change me and to make me into someone that is new. That's what I need from God. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to do what? To forgive us our sins. In other words, you're forgiven. And to do something even more astonishing and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what is won for us by Jesus, who chooses to forgive, who chooses to die on our place. That's the Hebrews lesson. And it cost him. What did it say he went through? He suffered loud cries and grief. In other words, when Jesus chose to die on the cross for us, it was not some, okay, I'll go do this. He wrestled with it as a human being. He knew what the price really was going to be, and it was high. Not just in terms of physical agony, as excruciating as the cross is, but more importantly than that, he who had always been in union with God, now experiencing what humanity knew, which was separation from God, so that he cries out even from the cross, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the cry of plenty of human beings who have not known or do not know the presence of God in their life. They feel abandoned, right, by God. Jesus knew that firsthand. In other words, he literally takes upon himself all of the suffering of humanity. And how, why does he do that? So that he can come into the very depths of our suffering and bring forgiveness, cleansing, healing, his mercy, and his peace. And in so bringing us that invites us into a new kind of life. That's where the gospel takes us. An ability to be able to walk with him. To have a different focus and orientation. To say, God, I'm here out of all that you've done for me. What can I do for you? I will serve you. I will serve you. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be. And whoever serves me, my Father will honor. Those are Jesus' words in the gospel. So that we come to receive forgiveness and mercy, not just to go back and do whatever we want to do. No, it's a... The very act of confession is also an act of dedication. Can't have one without the other, actually. Where you literally come and say, God, 
I'm not only asking for forgiveness and a changed heart, but align me with you. So that wherever I am, I know I'm operating in your presence. And it gets down to real practicals. It means waking up in the morning and saying, okay, God, I want to be a part of what it is that you're doing today. I don't know what you're doing, but I'd like to be a part of it. Give me opportunities to be able to serve you. So you're literally looking for opportunities in your conversation, in your people. You're the one who gets up and does the servant's work. You're the one who chooses to pray for somebody who's in need. You're the one who, when you see a need, right then, there's something a part of you that starts praying for that person. It just rises up within you because you know that wherever you are, whether it's the grocery store, whether you're pumping gas, whether you're just talking to your friends where you're sitting at a restaurant, whether you're around having coffee with somebody, you're there to be available for God and for His purposes. And that's really why you're there. You're not just there to see your friend. You're not just there to buy groceries. You're not just there to fill your tank. You're there to say, even in the midst of that, and you will be surprised at what happens. You're paying your gas with your credit card, and you need to run inside and get something. And so you're up at the counter, and you go, how are you? Most people in that position don't get asked that question. They just want to, you, the customer just wants to get in and out. And when you ask, you could be surprised about what it's told you. And you say as a result, I'll pray about that. And not only that, but if you can, if you can find it, you go back a couple of three days later, just, it, it's not just to pick up a bottle of water or something. You find this, you know, you told me three days ago that your mother was ill. How's she doing? I've been praying for her. In other words, you're going that second mile, you're building connections with people, you're serving, and you're caring about them because that's the heart of what it means to be a Christian. See, that's the kind of thing that Jesus would do. So if there's anything that I could say today is it shows us what we believe about Jesus, that he died on the cross for us, bringing forgiveness. It, as a result, shows us in a very clear way who we are, that we are people in need of forgiveness. We are people in need of a changed heart. We are the people who should be able to entrust to God all of who we are, the good and the bad. But in so turning to Him with who we are, we're not just asking for Him to take away the sin so I can just be me. It's so that I can actually become a servant. Someone who chooses to care. Someone who becomes available for God to use in the lives of other people. In acts of kindness, in generosity, in connecting with someone, in making a difference. Whether it be in an individual's life or in the life of one's community. God is looking for people who are willing to say, here I am. Here I am. Send me. I'll be here. Because we live in an incredibly haunted and broken world that knows very, very little about that kind of supernatural kindness. But that's what God has shown us. Will it cost us? Yes, it will cost us. It will feel inconvenient at times. It will feel at times that, oh, I don't want to call them. It will feel like a burden. It will stretch us. He who would save his life will lose it. But the promise is, is that God will honor those people who make themselves available for him. Whoever serves me, Jesus says, my father will honor. And that's what I want. I don't want to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And God looks at me and says, well, what, what did you do with your life anyway? We're invited into something to be available for him and for him to use us as the forgiven, being changed people that God is working in us. So that's the invitation today, to say yes, to be available for God to use you because you are being forgiven and changed 
and redeemed. And out of that, nothing makes a difference like that. Come and be a part of what God is doing. Know the joy of God honoring you as you give and serve other people. With his strength, with his power, because you know that he is with you and that he will never let you go. Amen.